trip overseas. We're always grateful to receive back those who are visiting. It's great to have visitors on campus as well today. Uh, and uh, just know that you are loved and you are prayed for. We're excited about this new semester and so many of the things that are going on. And uh, I've appreciated all the student feedback thus far to the things that are happening. And so keep us, keep us uh, connected and let us know if you're ever struggling or ever in need of help. Uh, don't, don't be a stranger. Uh, all the stores open all the time and we'll be glad to help any way we can. One of the great parts about my job is that I get to spend a lot of time around leaders. Um, college presidents, board members, executive VPs of colleges, accreditation commissioners in the church, elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and ministers, team leaders, CEOs, CFOs. My travels and my work put me around uh, leaders all of the time. And as I come into contact with leaders so often, it reminds me in my life personally and in the life of the church generally that we need to cultivate leadership with the same tenacity that Jesus did in his life and ministry. I believe leadership is more than um, whether or not someone can stand up in front of a crowd and give a talk or lead a song or do those kinds of things. Although those things are incredibly important, from what I've seen in the leaders that I've surrounded myself with is that even sometimes when we excel at, at specific tasks, we miss the greater call to bring people along with us and to learn how to lead one another. And uh, you've already heard a lesson from uh, President Brothers last week, and I'm just I'm sticking with the same theme just because it is an interest and in, in heart of mine. Uh, and it's not an indictment on the elders that we have in our churches. I want to say that clearly. Uh, all of us have great elders. Um, you have those men in your life uh, that are amazing and do a fantastic job in the local congregation. I just feel like maybe there's more that's out there, that there is opportunity ahead of us. And I think that we miss these opportunities because we don't have those specific and intentional ways in our own ministries and in our own lives where we're working hard to prepare people for leadership, which inevitably comes. You might find programs in the church that are focused on young people, for instance. But how many opportunities do you get in your local congregation as an adult or as a college-age person to cultivate your leadership skills? And by the way, I believe leadership is a cultivation of skills, and it's not just that you're born with it. Um, one of the things I learned in school, um, you might say, well, how in the world did you get where you are? It's certainly not by talent. <laughs> so, so how did you get there? Well, it's, it's through the, the sharpening of skills that you have to do over time when you learn things and grow. And what I've learned as I've come in contact with these leaders is there's no such thing as a non-leader. You cannot not be a leader. So if you're sitting in the audience right now and you're thinking, this lesson's not for me. It doesn't really apply. That's not really the area of my life I'm in. Maybe I serve this way, but I'm not a leader of anyone. Well, what I've learned is that that's just simply not true. Just by the virtue of the definition of leadership, Oxford English Dictionary says it's one who guides others into action or opinion. Just by being a human being, you guide other people in action and opinion. What I have found is there are no non-leaders, but there are bad leaders. And there are ineffective leaders. And there are good leaders. <coughs> bad leaders guide people into actions or opinions that are either through evil intent or bad intent or bad motives. So you may intentionally guide others into bad motives or bad opinions, and I think that makes you a bad leader. 
I think you can also unintentionally guide people into bad thoughts and bad motives, but you're still a bad leader if you do that. Ineffective leaders have trouble guiding people into action or thought or never intentionally, even though they might have the opportunity, never intentionally try to guide others into good actions. But good leaders intentionally seek out people to help and to guide and put themselves in situations where they have responsibility to do that. Welcome to de facto leadership. If you're going to be involved in church work, in church ministry, you will not have a choice in how this plays out. Just by virtue of your position, you will be a leader. So the question is not whether you have a choice to lead, it's what kind of leader will you be? And my thoughts are, if you've got to be one, why not try to be a good one? Why not think about how you can go from being a de facto leader to an intentional one? Someone who is trying to be a leader. And the only great example, the only perfect example, I guess, would be the better way to say it, is our Lord Jesus. There have been so many books about how to lead like Jesus. In fact, our president is going to release another book on how to lead like Jesus very soon, which is very, uh, it's very good. I've seen a lot of the content. You need to buy that book when it comes out and try to apply it to your own ministry and leadership. And these are just some reflections of mine. I'll share a scripture and reflection over the next few minutes. And hopefully we can see something in the life of Jesus that might motivate us to try to be more like him. So my first example comes from Luke 5, 27 through 32. I'd love for you to, if you've got your copy of the scriptures, if you turn there with me, I think we'll all do better if we follow along in the text together. After that, he, and that's Jesus, went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. One of the things that I've noticed about great leaders is that they aren't afraid of the messiness of having followers. Real true good leaders get their hands dirty in leadership. They seek out not just the person who is already equipped, already doing well, but those who are struggling and in need to try to influence and be a part of their lives. Uh, nobody knows this story other than my wife, I think, but there was a few years ago where I had decided in my mind and in my heart that I was going to quit. That I was going to take a different path in my life from the path that I'm on right now. It was a deep and distressing time in my life. I just lost my father. I lost him in 2013. And it caused you to question and do a lot of soul searching in your life. And sometimes to fall on shaky ground. And um, I was in a college class. On leadership with a great leader and somehow some way I still don't know how because I didn't say anything publicly but that great leader saw that I was in distress and he asked me to go to dinner while I was at that class and over the course of that week he spent extra time with me outside of class and to this day, 
the time of year when that class that I took those many years ago rolls around, I send him a little message of thanks that he changed my life. Because he wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty with someone who was struggling. We have to realize that there are benefits of finding and mentoring people even when you might be criticized for it. Jesus was criticized for calling Matthew. He was criticized for reaching out to him. And believe it or not, there'll be people in your congregation who criticize you when you spend time with people who need you the most. But great leaders seek out messy followers. Second um, story is from Luke 6. Uh, excuse me, Luke 11. And this was the text that was read. One of my uh, favorite aspects of this text is why did the disciples ask how to pray in the text in Luke 11 why did they ask Jesus how to pray he was praying the followers saw the model and the example of Jesus and they asked him what they should do in their own lives. And people who want to lead like Jesus, people who want to be great leaders, they have to first set a model and an example that causes people to ask, how do I live? How do I do this? So if we want people to truly be guided into their actions and thoughts, we have to first start with our own example and our own behavior. Several know this story of because uh, I've shared it so many times, but it was uh, 2003 and we were in a chapel session just like this. And it was after chapel and uh, I can remember the exact spot where I was standing in the back. I had received a job offer, my first job offer to become a full time youth minister. I was so scared. And so nervous, I'd been doing it part-time for a while. And so I pulled Bill Bacons over to the side and I shared with him my conundrum. And I said, Bill, I said, I've got this opportunity, but I don't think I'm ready. Why did I ask Bill that or share with him that? Because of his experience, because of his example, because I knew and I was right, in the moment he would have something important to share with me. And you know what he told me? I'll never forget it. He said, if we all waited till we were ready, none of us would be in ministry. And that teachable moment, I had a complete peace and calm about it because I thought, well, this guy, he knows what he's talking about. And so it's okay for me to take that important step. Great leaders take advantage of showing and not just telling. They take advantage of teachable moments. Luke chapter 6 is another, uh, in verse 37, is another place I think we can look to see what Jesus values in leadership. I don't know if you've ever noticed that this passage is in the context of where he talks about leading, but... You know this passage, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. You know this, this uh, scripture about how we're not to pass judgment. Give and it will be given to you. They'll pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So we get the, the point here that if we're judgmental of others, that is the measure that will be given to us. But look at verse 39. And he spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? And verse 40 is one you need to underline. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. So let me ask you, 
of all the great leaders in your life, are any of them perfect? Do any of them do everything flawlessly with no challenges or troubles or sin of their own? I don't know of any great leaders, even the ones that I love and cherish, beside the Lord himself, who don't also have their own flaws, their own problems, and their own challenges. What is different about those great leaders is that they understand that love is more important than judgment. Because they understand they have their own flaws. And one day they're going to need the love and grace and compassion of their followers in the same way in which they've given that same love and compassion. They understand that love isn't a zero sum game that, you know, the song love is something when you what give it away, you'll end up having more. They understand and are comfortable enough with their own imperfection to want other people to understand what grace is. Jesus, like leaders, value love and forgiveness. And finally, uh, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. If you'll turn there with me. Jesus, like leaders, want their followers to become leaders. So when you seek out, if you want to be a great leader and you seek out people to truly influence and get to follow you in your life, there'll come a time and there'll come a day in which you want your followers to exceed you, to be more than you, to be greater than you. That's what Jesus like leaders do. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages and he's teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And as he looks, verse 36, out on the people, the thing that he sees in the people, he sees, com he sees them and feels, the thing he feels is compassion because they're distressed like a sheep without a shepherd. So what does Jesus do when he looks out on people and he sees that they're distressed? He sees that they're in need. When he feels that compassion, what is his response to this observation? Does he go and he take away their distress? Does he intervene and miraculously cure their, their need in the distress? Well, he's taken away their sickness and their disease, but they're still distressed in the crowd. And what his reaction is, is verse 37. He turns to his disciples, his followers, and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus says, we see the same problem and I need you to be a part of the solution. Beg of God to send workers into the harvest and by implication, you need to be part of that crowd. Jesus, like leaders, understand that leadership isn't inherited. You don't get it passed down to you, but that it's taught, it's trained and practiced by men and women, and it's fostered by God himself. They understand how few people will actually take up the call to leadership, but they pray and they work with everything they have to beat that trend and show fruit from their own leadership. And one of the things that I think is clear in this passage is that Jesus shows us that if people can't see what you see, they won't do what you do. Jesus wanted them to see the need of the people so that they would respond in the appropriate way. If we want to be great leaders, we've got to share that same passion with our people and encourage them to do what ultimately needs to be done. I think we all have responsibility to cultivate better leadership in our church, better leadership in ourselves, and I think the best place to learn that is from Jesus himself. Key principles, in summary, 
Great leaders seek out followers, even the tough ones. Great leaders take advantage of teachable moments, and you can't do that unless you've got an example. Great leaders value love and forgiveness over judgment. And great leaders, one day, would love to see their followers become greater than they. What pathway are you on in your life to greater leadership? How is Jesus leading you and me? Would you bow with me and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing of opening your word and being able to be touched by it, to be changed by it, molded by it. Father, we pray that we'll submit our hearts and our lives to your grace and mercy. And that one day we will be able to guide others into action. And Father, pray that the fruits of that will be positive and good. And Father, we pray that we will have made some impact. And as you've called workers into your harvest, that we might be part of that chosen few. Forgive us when we fail you, when we don't seek out to help others or to be there for others. Give us the energy and compassion to, to work with all diligence and to believe with all faith. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.